Are you ready for some spoilers? Can I get a pie? Zo! Pie! Zo! Pie! Zo! Excellent. You guys are ready. <laughs> Won't Joy do it? <laughs> Andre made me do it. Anyway. <laughs> Welcome to PaizoCon. I'm Lisa Stevens. I'm the CEO of Paizo. And, uh, welcome to PaizoCon 11. Wow. Lucky 11. Um, like always, I like to start every PaizoCon banquet <laughs> by recognizing the man Without whom we would not be here tonight, Mr. Tim Nightingale. Tim, how are you? So Tim's the guy that 11 years ago said, hey, let's get together and uh, yeah, we were on the message boards, let's get together and do a convention. Let's call it PaizoCon. Maybe Paizo will even come. <laughs> We did for one day. We did a, it was a day worth of stuff. It was fun. And we liked it so much. We're like, Tim, can we, can we like do it next year? I mean, I can't like doing that. So we've been doing it every, every year since. But without Tim and a whole bunch of people uh, who, who did that first one, I don't think we ever saw how cool it was to hang out with you guys for a weekend. So, again, thank you, Tim. Who was at that first PaizoCon? Raise your hand if you were at that first PaizoCon. <laughs> So there was like 40 people, so how many of them? <laughs> what now? <laughs> Is that all employees? All right, raise your hand if you're not a Paizo employee, you're at the first PaizoCon. All right, I got one. All right, do it off you over there. All right, good. So has anybody been, raise your hand if you've been to every PaizoCon that's been ever been. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's the employees again, down with it. She's right. Like one? One? That's awesome. The Tim was down there. Tim was down So, thank, you know, this, this year is a pretty big year. I, I want to let you know that Paizo has grown quite a bit. Yeah. Um, when we started this little thing, we, we were like 23, 24 employees. We just passed somewhere into the 70s this year. Um, enough that we actually are hiring an HR person. She'll be here tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, Monday. Uh, make sure you welcome her. We actually need someone to just run personnel at Paizo, which is great. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of things right now. Starfinder, the second edition of Pathfinder. Um, we've got the most amazing staff. Uh, I've been, as many of you know, I've been blessed to have been in a lot of really awesome companies through my years, 31 years in this industry. And I think this may be the best company, personnel-wise, I've ever been at. So expect great things out of these guys. Anyway. <laughs> See the husband laugh. Without further ado, because Eric will get mad at me if I no. make this drag out too damn long. I'm going to introduce tonight's MC, the King of Horror himself, Eric Mona. All right, uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, a lot of people, when confronted with a microphone and a huge crowd of people, become power drunk. I'm happy to say our CEO is halfway there. Okay. Uh... Hi, everybody. <laughs> I am Eric Mona. I am the publisher and chief creative officer here at Paizo. Welcome, one and all, to PaizoCon 2018. We are thrilled to have you with us here yet again for the 11th PaizoCon. Um, I would like uh, for all of the employees at Paizo to just stand up for just a second. We've gone way, way, way past the time when I can name everybody. But these are the people. These, these 
these are the folks. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, keep plotting. Yeah, I won't interrupt. These guys and girls work uh, very, very hard. Every aspect of Paizo's production is represented by staff here, from the creative folks who make up all the crazy stories about elves and dragons, to the art team that makes it look so good, to customer service, to our finance team that makes sure we all get paid, to the warehouse, the tech team, uh, and uh, everybody in between. Just uh, It's great to have uh, everybody here at Paizo and to have you guys all here with us for an annual celebration of the company and of Pathfinder and now Starfinder as well. So uh, this year we're going to try something a little bit different. Um, more than a few people have suggested, uh, and usually it's couched by something like, great job at the, uh, the presentation, it seemed a little long this year. So uh, I'm happy to say that with great assistance uh, from a lot of our panelists here and a lot of the members of my staff who continue to suggest that we cut more slides, uh, we are going to have this thing done sooner than ever before. I am virtually certain we'll be out of here by 1 a.m. this morning. Yes. So here's the beautiful picture of Team Paizo, but uh, if you do see these folks, uh, just come up and say hi. Uh, we're running demos of the new game, as you know. Um, I'm proud and pleased to say it's not just the editors and, and designers who are running those games. We've got people from every part of the company, um, you know, throwing dice, and that's the, what this is all about. Um, so thank you, uh, guys, once again. Um, all right, and I will uh, say one more time, in order to keep this short, it will involve the cooperation of our fellow presenters. Jason. <laughs> Speaking of Jason, uh, we are going to have a whole bunch of awesome reveals about Pathfinder 2nd Edition uh, during this presentation. In fact, when Jason suggested the, the list of slides that we were to present, I, I, I had to go to him and I'm like, dude, are you serious? We're going we're gonna to leak all this stuff at this thing? Are you, we'll have nothing left. <laughs> and he said, that's the idea. And so, all right, so here we go. Uh, put your helmets on. I'd like to also welcome, uh, for the first time ever, we have an audience that is not in the building. We are streaming live on the official Paizo channel on Twitch. Uh, so hello to all the people who are watching us all around the world. We are sorry that you are not with us here this year, but we do expect you next year. So we'll see you then. Um, okay, I'd like to start off by recognizing our guests of honor this year, and we are truly honored uh, to have uh, a couple of uh, guests of honor this year. Uh, the first is our, our illustrator guest of honor, Taylor Fisher. Uh, I Yes, Taylor, where are you, Taylor? Somewhere? She's somewhere. All right. Excellent. So Taylor is set up in the store and she's doing sketches. She told me just before the banquet that um, she's got a couple of slots probably open for sketches yet. So if you'd like to get just an amazing illustration of your character by one of the, the, the bright talents that has brought us the Starfinder uh, and uh, stuff like Occult Adventures, uh, head over to Taylor's booth in the store as early as you can tomorrow to get signed up because I guarantee uh, that will not be available forever. She's also got prints um, and a bunch of other uh, stuff uh, that uh, is available for sale there. So thanks to Taylor. I, I saw the monster that you guys created in a seminar the other day, and that thing looks nasty. So very, very cool. Also thrilled this year to be joined by the miscreants from the Glass Cannon podcast. Where are they? We are uh, thrilled to have them with us as well. Uh, they are the official uh, li uh, actual play podcast for uh, Pathfinder, and they just started a Starfinder podcast as well, Androids and Aliens, and it is awesome. You can check that out. Uh, it's Glass Cannon Podcast, uh, and uh, they also have a Patreon. And on the Patreon, they're doing a Ruins of Aslan uh, campaign as well. So hope you had a chance to participate in some of their events here. You guys still doing stuff up in your room? Tomorrow and stuff? I don't mean your personal room, Joe. I mean the, the glass cannon. Okay. So anyway, thank you guys for coming. We are thrilled to have you here. 
Uh, now is the customary time when I advance the presentation to the slide of our partners, and I've inevitably forgot a few. Before I do that, I will say I hope you had a chance to check out the rotating presentation that we had going on as you guys were getting your food. Um, uh, we've got more partners than ever before. Many of them are here with us uh, tonight, uh, and uh, they had a great uh, presentation of some of their upcoming stuff. Um, and here is a whole bunch of them. Not all of them, uh, but we are honored to have uh, folks from all of these companies with us tonight. If you're one of our licensing partners, could you uh, raise your hand or something? How about a little uh, round of applause for our folks like, yes, thank you. All right, uh, I would like to also thank the staff of the Doubletree Hotel. I hope you guys are enjoying the meal. They're working very hard to make sure that everything goes off without a hitch. Uh, how about a round of applause for the staff here at the Doubletree? the hospitality that the Doubletree has shown us the last few years and uh, it's nice to have a, a, a home here and uh, we uh, lots of space to grow and thank you Doubletree. All right so in the spirit uh, oh one last thing I hope you enjoyed the chicken and the steak. Uh, I, we wanted maybe to have pork on the menu today um, but uh, Crystal Fraser came to me before and she said be sure that you don't serve Squealy Nord. I, <laughs> That was awesome, but from up here it just sounded like a lot of yelling. What? <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. Inside jokes. All right. So, uh, <laughs> so again, in the uh, interest of moving things along, I am going to flee the podium here, and I would like to welcome the creative director of Starfinder, Rob McCreary, who will be showing us uh, some upcoming things from the Starfinder line. Rob. Hello, everyone. So, it's kind of weird this weekend. I've been hearing lots of things about some kind of second edition, and it's really confusing because, like, Starfinder just came out last year. And, and anyways, like, the internet told me that Starfinder was Pathfinder second edition. I, I don't know. In any case, we've got lots of uh, really cool stuff coming out for Starfinder this year. Um, first and foremost would be the Starfinder Armory, or as I like to call it, Obazaya and Quig go shopping. Um, I've got one of the few pre-print copies we have here right in my hands, and it's full of awesome equipment the goodness, which I'll hopefully show off with some of you all tonight. So, what is Armory all about? Well, the first thing is it is full of new equipment, which is super handy if you're fighting off the Dominion of the Black because you need to get your brain back, um, which our Iconics are doing right here. So what kind of equipment? Weapons. This is, uh, this is only the first of, of many weapons. You might have noticed there's no third level plasma rifle in the Starfinder Core rulebook. Well, now you're going to have the 12 notch plasma fork, um, basically a rail gun for plasma bolts. Maybe you're bemoaning the lack of a higher level flame pistol. Well, we have the electromagnetic, excuse me, electromagnetic rad shot, which irradiates your foes on a critical hit. These are frowned upon in polite society, I should say. Um, this is just a small selection. There's crystalline res resonant pistols from Leovara. Um, we also have the Sentry Shield Projector, which wraps up your BFF in a protective force field. You know, keep them safe from the monsters. There's lots more than just weapons and armory, though. We also have powered armor. Lots and lots of powered armor. I know a lot of people have been looking for more powered armor. This is a small selection. Um, we have a nice little red suit there called the Stag Step Suit. This has some fey materials in it, lets you fold reality and dimension door around, and it also comes with a very fashionable pair of antl antlers. <laughs> right behind it, we have the Spellcaster's Aegis. This gives spellcasters um, a bonus on their saving throws against spells. It's got some nice cool runes behind it, and also boosts their dispel attempts. So lots and lots of new power armor, normal armor as well. Um, We've got technological items. You know, a lot of the mechanic has a drone that follows them around everywhere. If you're not playing a mechanic, can you get a drone? You can now. Domestic drones, such as our physician drone here, follow you around, inject you with whatever you need to stay into combat. Um, to keep you up, you know, to keep you from dying in combat, that sort of thing. Um, 
We've also got lots more player, just besides equipment and armory, we've got a lot of new player options. Um, here we have a Vesk Solarian. Um, there's something for every class, but the Vesk is pretty cool because there's a new Zenith revelation called Quantum Entrapment, which basically shunts your target outside of space and time completely. Um, so that's a kind of fun thing. But there's something for every class. Every kind of thing you would want is here in Armory. This is coming out in July, and that's 160 pages. But that's not all, because in October, we have the Alien Archive 2. Yeah. Also 160 pages. It is full of alien creatures, um, and some familiar ones too. You might see the Trox there. There's also the Vlaka, the Assassin Robot, the Bolita, and the Space Llama. I mean, uh, the, the Ruthig, the Ruthig, it's called the Ruthig. They're all playable races. No, I'm just kidding, you can't play the robot. Um, you can't play the Ruthig either, but it, it's fun if you go to a planet with herd animals. But maybe you're looking for something a little less humanoid. We have here the answer to the age-old question, what happens if you cross a laser with a wolf? Well, you get the Tashkari, um, also called laser wolves. They've uh, got some very bad breath in the form of a laser that shoots out of their mouths. And they have three legs, because, you know, aliens. <laughs> As usual, for an alien archive, we've got a lot of uh, playable races for you. Um, for instance, have you ever wanted to play an intelligent slug? Well, now you can. This is the Osharu. Uh, they're scientist monks. They kind of believe that religion and science are completely intertwined. You just make sure you don't put any salt on their food. Take that off the table when the Osharu comes visiting. We've got plenty of player options in Alien Archive 2 as well. Here we have the Glass Serpent of Eox, and if you can get a hold of some of its scales, um, there's a nice light warp inlay armor upgrade. It lets you turn invisible and everything just like they do. But, you know, maybe you don't want more monsters. Maybe you want something a little more friendly, a little more cuddly. Well, let me, pre let me present the squawks. Part squirrel, part fox, all squawks. <laughs> And you know the squawks comes with we have both the adult and the and the juvenile version here, but what's that? Plushies. Yep, plushies. plushies. There we go. Well, you know, for for anything cuddly, whether you're squawks or some other friend, uh, you need to carry them into battle, keep them safe. We've got a new piece of equipment. It's called the pet carrier, but as we in the star chamber call it, it's the squawks bucket. And, uh, just please don't put it in the microwave. The squawks doesn't like that. So that's it for Alien Archive 2, but we've got some new adventure paths coming out as well for Starfinder. Uh, first up in August is the Against the Aeon Throne adventure path. Uh, for, the first, for the first time, the uh, Starfinder adventure path will be going monthly, and, uh, and we're trying out a three-volume adventure path now. So Against the Aeon Throne is about liberating a pack world's colony from an occupation by the Aslanti Star Empire. And, <laughs> and you'll be also fighting the Star Empire's elite military, the Aeon Guard, like Lieutenant Sharu, the, who, who you can see right here. Uh, that'll take us up from 1st to 7th level, um, and up through October. And we follow that in November with the Signal of Screams adventure path. Uh, this is another three-volume adventure path. Um, there's a plague of madness and horrible transformations that is spreading through the pack worlds, and there's maybe a disturbing connection to the shadow plane involved here. You'll meet lots of interesting new people, like Yazaloya here. She's a champion in the sport of Brutaris, one of the most popular contact sports in the pack worlds. Uh, Signal of Screams will actually start at 7th level, so although it is a separate adventure path, you can play it as a sequel to uh, Against the Aeon Throne. And that'll take us through January. And in February, we have the Dawn of Flame adventure path. Uh, we talked about this at our Starfinder AP Q&A panel yesterday. This is going back to the six months, uh, so a full six volumes. And this involves the sun of the Pact Worlds being invaded from somewhere that you need to stop them. Not sure who might be invading, but that might be a clue with our, with our big fella there. And this will take you all the way up to 13th level. So that's what we've got coming up for Starfinder in the near future. And now I'd like to bring up uh, the Pathfinder's creative director, James Jacobs.
Thank you, Mr. McCurry. Hey, Pies of Kind, how you guys doing? All right. Before I start going into uh, what we've got uh, for the rest of uh, first edition uh, in the wings, I wanted to do the design team a little bit of favor. Maybe give them a little bit of inspiration, Jason. <laughs> All right. So, have anybody been able to try out the the delve, test out the new rules yet for here today? <laughs> I'd like you to raise your hand if one of your characters was killed. Oh, come on! Keep them up. Let's see those hands. Come on! One, two, three, four. Jason the monster. All right, all right, all right. Hang on, hang on. Um, raise your hand if you've had your character killed in a first edition Pathfinder game. Oh. Jason, you need to make the game harder. <laughs> I could, uh, there's this thing with hit points, they don't need to have double digits. <laughs> two? two. two. Uh, can both of them be one? Yeah. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. All right, uh, let's see here. So going forward with, uh, for the next couple of months, we're still doing, we're still gonna be supporting, of course, uh, the first edition of Pathfinder. It's something we've been working on forever and we wanna keep going as long as we can. And so here's some of the lovely fellows that you will be encountering along the way over the next couple of months. Yes, that is a goblin grave knight. His name is Rip Nugget. Um, <laughs> so um, these are characters that we've got throughout the uh, uh, various products that we'll be releasing over the next several uh, uh, months. Uh, one of the big products of our, that's coming up, of course, is Planar Adventures. So this is going to be the last of the first edition hardcovers. Uh, so as we try to get in as much content as we could for everybody that we could think of. There's archetypes in here, there's spells, there's magic items. There's all sorts of information on the planes themselves. One thing that's always kind of bothered me that I realized as I started working on this is we don't really know where the gods live. I mean, we've mentioned here and there their houses and their, their realms. This one corrects that. This gives this will tell you where, say, um, Zongathon actually lives. And it might even give you a few hints on where he came from. We'll see. Um, we've also got a bunch of new monsters in here, and they kind of run the gamut from like really low-level stuff. We've got three new uh, player-friendly uh, races. Uh, we've got a lawful race called the Aphorite, which is kind of an axiomite that is downshifted a little bit, so it's a little friendlier to play. We've got a character from uh, the Boneyard, and we got uh, the Gonzi from uh, the Chaotic Plane. So that's going to be some new stuff for players to play with. And the GMs, we didn't forget about you. Uh, we are going to have at least one, well, just one, CR30 creature in here. It's one of the biggest things we've ever published. Um, its name starts with an L, and the rest kind of rhymes with Eviathan, so I'll let you figure out maybe what it might be. So that'll be coming out in July, 200, uh, 280 pages. Uh, we've got a copy here at the show, right? But it's behind glass, and no one can see anything but the cover. Yeah. <laughs> Go ogle it. It's, it's good stuff. Um, we're going to be continuing to put out pocket editions throughout 2018 of all of the other uh, books. And here's a nice big list of all uh, the ones we got coming up. Best Jerry 3, Advanced Class Guide, Best Jerry 4, Ultimate Magic, Ultimate Combat, Best Jerry 5, NPC Codex, Against Race Guide. So those uh, give you basically an idea of we're continuing to uh, get these out. We're going to keep putting these out as long as people want them. And, it's really kind of handy having these things a lot smaller so you don't like strain your back. We're all starting to get up in age, some of us. And it's kind of nice to not, like, give yourself, you know, all sorts of complications because you just wanted to play a game. So, we've got uh, two more Adventure Paths for first edition. And we wanted to make sure that they were the most awesomestest Adventure Paths possible. Uh, the first one is one that I've been kind of in the back of my mind planning on for... Um, since the start, really. And uh, funny story, people have always been asking me, let's, let's have an adventure path that has time travel. And I've always told them, no, time travel, that's, that's too complicated. That wrecks things. And we'll never do time travel. What I was really trying to say is like, wait till uh, you get to uh, Return of the Rune Lords. <laughs> of course, 
starts. This one starts at first level. We can't have you fighting, you know, monsters from time and stuff like that at the start, or can we? Um, so you start out fighting reef claws by the creepy haunted house up in uh, the woods and all that. Uh, this is a standard uh, adventure path model. It goes for uh, six volumes. Uh, this one will bring you all the way to 20th level and give you some time to play at 20th level at the very end. You'll need them. Don't thank me. <laughs> um, one of the ways we're pulling this off is by kind of, we're removing one of the support articles from the back. So there's only going to be two support articles in each one of these. We made us really double down and make sure that the ones we put on are really cool and Ron has been awesome in helping me get those out. So let's have a thumbs up for Ron. So, Return the Rune Lords will be fired up uh, coming in, uh, Gen Con will be, the, or no, we won't have it, Gen, uh, well, anyway, it, around Gen Con, I don't know if it'll be in on time for Gen Con, because, well, we'll see. make it happen, or you have the power. Um, anyway, Return of the Rune Lords uh, is the third in the trilogy, uh, started with Rise of the Rune Lords, followed up with Shattered Star, and this one is the one where everything that happened in those adventures makes it look like it was on easy mode. Um, again, you'll be going to 20th level. There will be time travel, and time travel messes with things in the past, which means when you start messing with time travel near the later parts, it starts messing with what you're doing in the earlier parts, and it's really complicated, and I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, I just got to the third one, which uh, was written by Richard Pett, and um, as I was uh, developing it, I noticed something weird. Richard always puts, like, pigs into his adventures. I mean, there's, like... Uh, Curse the Crimson Throne, he had like Blood Pig, which is the best game ever. Uh, this one, there's a section where uh, you're like in Corvosa celebrating like the death of uh, Queen Iliosa a while back, and there's the big festival, and you gotta show somebody around who's really powerful and may have something to do with the rising plot, and yeah, I'm not gonna spoil who she is, but she's powerful. And um, you don't wanna make her mad, so you wanna kinda entertain her, and one of those involves uh, chasing down a pig that may have swallowed a Luxstone. <laughs> that, the pig gets the Luxstone benefits. He's carrying it. <laughs> so, whether or not you can catch him or not, whether how you get that Luxstone out of him, that's up to you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's it's like it's not Squealy Nord. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, so that's Return of the Rune Lords. Uh, goes up to 20th level. Uh, you will probably have uh, some. Uh, if you have any questions about that, want to hear anything more about it, check out. We're doing an answer, uh, ask the uh, 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 panel about all the adventure paths and stuff tomorrow at 4 o'clock, I believe. That's also where we're going to be talking more about the last first edition adventure path that will be launching uh, next February. Um, I'm not going to tell you much about it because this is uh, Crystal is making it all sorts of crazy. I'm not going to spoil how it starts because it's super awesome. <laughs> yeah, um, but I will tell you uh, that it is called, in this next thing, we don't have the art in yet, but we found a picture of somebody that may be fe featuring a pretty strong role in it. It's the Tyrant's Grasp. It's all about leshies. <laughs> So yeah, check out the uh, panel tomorrow. Uh, we'll be answering all sorts of questions about this and, and probably misdirecting a few people. Uh, one more thing that's coming up that I'm actually really excited to finally get out is uh, a big book about Sandpoint. <laughs> this is something that I've, I've kind of been trying to write forever, and uh, this one's a 96-page uh, soft cover. It basically presents every location in Sandpoint. The, the, uh, I wish we had the picture of, of, there's like this panoramic view of Sandpoint, which is one of the most incredible pieces of art I've ever seen us publish. It's really cool. Um, yeah, it's, it's good stuff. Uh, you can see, like, my, I can see my house in there. <laughs> so it's pretty nice. Um, this book will have, like, full details on every building of note in the town and in the region surrounding it. Uh, there'll be, like, quests for you. Uh, every building has its own rumor. Uh, we're going to reveal all sorts of information about like um, secrets and st if, if it's if it's something that you've wondered about in Sandpoint, it's probably answered in this book because this has got everything I have to say about Sandpoint, more or less. Um, so yeah, uh, that's the Sandpoint Devil on the cover. Can't do a Sandpoint book without the Devil. And there we go. So that's uh, pretty much what the the big things we've got planned in the future for the rest of Pathfinder. There's obviously going to be other 
products and, and uh, fun stuff along the way, but Eric is slowing us down, making us rush through this thing, right? I didn't want to put all these slides up here. <laughs> Actually, I told him we should slow it down. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to see the floor now to somebody some of you may have uh, heard of before. Who's, who's this? Tanya? Tanya? Good evening. Hi, Tanya. Hi, everybody. Um, so, you may notice a new logo up there. We are transitioning some of our organized play operations to a not-for-profit foundation known as Organized Play Foundation. It gives us the ability to do bigger and better things in organized play. And um, there will be a lot of changes coming up this year. Uh, I don't have a lot of things to say yet on it, but watch the blogs, watch the boards, and for the volunteers, watch your emails. <laughs> um, one of the things uh, it allows us to do um, is, is spread. And you know we are already a very large organization, but we need more members. We need more members, but to have more members, we need more people helping. If you ran a game, if you ran a panel, if you did something, the inkling of volunteerism, stand up for a minute, yes. because without you, we can't make our events happen. Thank you from the bottom of the heart. Without you, I don't have a job. Without you, I can't travel the world. So we appreciate you, each and every one that runs a game, whether it be your local store or here at a big convention. Um, in years past, we have recognized a Paizo Volunteer of the Year. We are breaking with tradition this year. We will be doing recognitions through the Organized Play Foundation from here on out. So we will have some announcements on that, but again, not tonight. We do have some announcements I can share with you, which is really good because I, I, I get to share secrets. Um, <laughs> I need to share secrets. Starfinder Society, we rolled this out less than a year ago. It does not feel like it has been less than a year. On that one, we started with one scenario. <laughs> it's over to Thirsty. Um, but we are now at two scenarios a month and more maniacal cackling in the office through Thirsty, John Compton, uh, Linda gets in there, and our newest developer, Michael Sayer. So it, it's a fun team to bounce ideas off of. Some of the ideas that we had led us to say we couldn't finish the story from last season yet. We weren't done. Um, the year the Scoured Stars needed more input. So this year at Origins, we are launching season 1A which is a pivot in the year of the Scoured Stars. Uh, it will start with an interactive invasion of the Scoured Stars where we are going to go back and find out what happened to that missing expedition. That missing 0-99 scenario that we never quite published. Um, but, but we can't let nothing new come about. So we have a new season symbol. The trinary star system that is the Scoured Stars. One of the things that started when we, when we started putting Starfinder Society together, because we could build it from the ground up, we could come up with some new ideas and new things. And we went to Tech and we said, hey Tech, we've got some things, but we, we need And Tech said, yes, and delivered. So one of the things we had to do is introduce some new minor factions. There will still be the five majors that you are used to from this past year, but we will start putting in smaller ones that will be tier two, tier three factions that you can aim, earn your reputation and fame with. Uh, that will be a blend. We introduced the first one here. If you GM'd Starfinder games, you got to see the Manifold Host. It is a new minor faction for uh, people to join. It is all about welcoming strange alien races into the society because <laughs> Starfinder has given us so many strange alien races like Space Walrus. <laughs> so you too can be a Space Walrus in society. Um, it also has allowed us to be much more responsive as a campaign, so we gave you things like Star Sugar Heart Love. <laughs> from your ever 
ever-loving band, Strawberry Machine Cake, yeah. brainchild of Eleanor. So new things there, but more on this, the Starfinder side is new innovations on what we want to try with organized play. It has kind of been our testing ground. Thank you for being guinea pigs as we look towards what we want to do with Pathfinder Society in second edition. Um, speaking of which, Pathfinder Society. This will be our 11th season because we had our season zero. And in 11 seasons, we've done a lot of storylines and a lot of bad guys and a lot of NPCs out there and we're still trying to wrap them. When we did Year of Faction's Favor, we knew that we had stories that were gonna take a little bit longer and they started putting the seeds in this season. But at the end, at Gen Con, you will get to see the Year of the Ten. For those of you that have joined the Society in more recent years, it is the Helmet of the December at the Leaders of the Pathfinder Society, and it is the Feathers of the Ruby Phoenix, hearkening back to Season 3. We are going to be bringing back a few of those old favorite NPCs and a few of those old favorite foes, and we are launching it with Hao Jing Cataclysm, the interactive 10-00 at Gen Con. I'm glad some people are excited. Um, <laughs> again, more maniacal cackling. Um, but we've, we've wanted to do this, and we want to really set the scene well and bring some things to closure before we get ready to launch season one in 2019 of Pathfinder Society. TBD? Second edition? I'm not sure what. We, we are waiting on what the outcome of the playtest is before we set a lot of decisions. We are asking you for feedback from that playtest before we set a lot of decisions. Uh, the team has a framework structure in mind, but everything else is up to you. So, to that being said, we have surveys coming out for playtests, and Jason will talk more to that. We've got lots of methods to play the playtest. And I'm sure Jason will talk more to that. Um, but the Society will have four adventures, three launching at Gen Con, one in September, that are playtest oriented using those rules. And we would love our Society members to try them. We'd love our non-Society members to try them and to tell us what you think of them and what you think of our format. So Woo! feedback, please. <laughs> Help the team and I make this your Society. We also have the Adventure Card Guild. And the last couple of years, the Adventure Card Guild, we wrapped it into the Pathfinder Society RPG family as well, and we made them all one big society with the same season over it, um, kind of overarching storylines. We're doing that this year, but with a little bit of a twist. Same season symbol but we are at Season of Tapestries Tides. It will launch again with the Haojin Cataclysm and have an interactive component for it. It will be using the Skull and Shackles base set. So we're going a little bit back in that history. It will be similar but unique to the RPG storyline. So if you want the entire season feel, you want to play both sides. Uh, it's a six adventure and it will wrap by PaizoCon next year because our fellow friends at Lone Shark and Mike Selinger have some announcements. So if I can ask him to come up and spoil that one. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Hiya. Hi. I'd like, to, I'd like to thank Lisa for, Lisa for dividing the room into a pie side and a zo side. Still waiting for my pie. So I'd like to be a part of that in the future. Uh, I'm Mike Selinker. I'm the uh, lead designer of the Pathfinder Adventure card game. I've uh, been working with Paizo now. It's been uh, 14 years, um, which has been great. We made uh, the Harrow deck together. Uh, we made uh, all the games in Titanic line and uh, about... Seven years ago, which is staggering, uh, I came to them with this idea for a card game based on the Pathfinder RPG, and um, they didn't let me out of the room before I, I agreed to a deal. It was pretty great, and it it turned out pretty good. Uh, I did a I did a count. Um, 
In that time, we have made, in the time since then, we have made four boxed adventure paths, three, 32 adventure boxes, 25 character decks, six organized play adventure paths, play mats, inserts, promo cards, Lord knows what else. I can't even keep track anymore. We have made a lot of stuff for a humble little card game that was supposed to, you know, have a nice, I mean, maybe a one-year run and then we'd be happy with it. It turned out to be quite a bit bigger than that, and we thank all you guys for making it uh, such a success. However, we have a, a, a common saying around, uh, the, uh, around us game designers that the design on the second edition begins the minute the first edition is released. And so uh, we immediately noticed that there were a lot of things about the game that, that maybe could use a little bit of improvement. I mean, we, you can't make that many things without going back to the well and wanting to change a bunch of things along the way. So uh, I was asked last year to come up here and talk about my plans for the next set of Pathfinder uh, Adventure Card Game products, and I declined because I had this idea, and I didn't know if it would work. I just really had no idea. So I said no, and Vic came up here and told everybody anyway, which was nice of him. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, but... Uh, I, um, I I really had no idea whether we'd be able to pull it off. Uh, spoiler, we did. Um, as you may notice on your way in to play various other Pathfinder games, uh, we are running playtests of the brand new uh, base set for the Pathfinder Adventure card game, the core set. It's going to be a very different kind of product, and I wanted to give you guys a, a little sense of what we're doing. But before I do that, uh, I do want to show you something that I'm pretty excited about, uh, and that is that our free RPG day card, um, our character card, is based on the, uh, the new, um, uh, the character Knock Knock from the upcoming uh, computer game that, of Kingmaker, which uh, my friend Chris Avalon is involved in, and uh, this is about the weirdest thing we've ever made. So get a copy. It's just in a couple weeks uh, if you've played the card game, or even if you haven't. It's, it's a pretty damn entertaining card. Um, but, but let me get back to, uh, to where, we're, where we're going with this. We decided that uh, after years of making boxes that if you push them over the right way could kill a dachshund, we decided <laughs> maybe we didn't have to do that forever. Right, um, So we decided to break our game up a little bit. We decided to say, all right, what happens if we make a generic universal base set called the core set? A, a set of cards that you can play all the way through. If you just want to buy it, it's not that expensive. You buy it and you play it and it's all good and you never need to buy anything else if you don't want to. But we wanted to combine that with a set of adventure paths, which could be of varying sizes, which we've never been able to do. And the first one that we really wanted to do, we've been talking about doing this for many years. It was actually the second one we wanted to do before some people at Paizo said, what if you did some pirates instead? Um, and that's this thing. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of this. <laughs> It turns out this is our, one of our favorite adventure paths, uh, and we have been wanting to do it for years. Um, if you met Keith Richmond, who's uh, one of my fellow designers, he's right over there. Um, he, uh, he basically came on board the company because he had run Curse of the Crimson Throne three times. And I was like, we're going to need that right away, and that was like five years ago. So... Um, <laughs> But we're going to do it, and we're going to do it all in one box. We're not going to do the same model that we've been doing where we piece out everything over a month, every month basis. We decided just one box of Curse of the Crimson Throne, and then if we want to do something else after that, we can make it whatever size we want, uh, and it'll be pretty great to have that uh, thing. Here's one thing I want to say more than anything else. Our game will be fully compatible with all previous sets that we have made. Now, this was a very complicated decision. We didn't want to invalidate everything that we'd done before. Um, so calling this a second edition would be a mistake because um, we want everything that we have ever created to work well within the system. So we haven't blown up the moon here. We figured we'd need it tomorrow. So uh, we just decided that we wanted to get all the things that people have been telling us about our game, that they kept saying, like, oh, I love your game. I mean, I hate this one thing. but And that, that list got longer and longer over time. <laughs> so, 
So we decided to fix everything. And so uh, you'll you'll see it as you you come in and play test with us. We'd love to have you come if you're here to uh, to uh, the ballroom. We'll we'll run you through some play tests. We'll show you what I mean. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but but there's a lot of uh, subtle changes that I think you'll like a lot. Um, now the sad news uh, here is I don't have a slide of the the box cover or anything like that. And I'm never going to have that opportunity to present that at PaizoCon, which makes me very sad. That's because it will be out at PaizoCon next yeah. year. So we'll, uh, it will debut at this convention, both the core set and uh, Curse of the Crimson Throne. We'll have many tables that you can play at. Um, maybe then we'll tell you about future sets that we want to make. Uh, we want to, I want to tell you just about a couple of other things that we're doing though. One of the things that happened over the time that we launched it was we, uh, the organized play, uh, experience got crazy popular for the, for the game. And, uh, we discovered that we could tell stories that didn't fit on cards this big. We got to be, make nice big uh, pages that, that uh, and it became a very different kind of experience that people had. So we said, screw it, we're doing that. We're going to give you storybooks from now on that tell real stories about the Pathfinder universe, maybe some you haven't ever seen before. Um, we, uh, we're going to include pawns in all of our, all our sets from now on, uh, or, and whenever we introduce characters, we're hoping to introduce uh, pawns with them. Um, all the Iconics in the second edition RPG will be in the ACG core set. Um, so if there happens to be a goblin alchemist in that book, there will be one in, in the... Yeah, we have no idea. We have no idea if there is. We just think that would happen there. It will happen here. Um, we'll kick off a new adventure path as you, uh, in organized play, is uh, after we finished Season of Tapestry's Tide, we'll do an adventure path uh, that has some tie-ins to Curse. Um, we're going to put the character deck line on a hiatus while we do this. We'll probably come back to some things along the way like that, but for now we're really focused on the uh, fact that we have a new format, uh, a new set of rules, a great play experience, and, and this convention has shown us that we think we might even be on the right track. So uh, if you'd like to come play with us, we would love to have you do so. Uh, come find us in the ballroom. Uh, and again, thank you very much for supporting uh, a different way to play in the Pathfinder world. We really appreciate it. The next, the next person to take the stage the first day I met him threatened to suck all my delicious blood out of my body. <laughs> he hasn't done it yet. Maybe the night's the night. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jason Bowman. PaizoCon! I am Jason Bowman. I am the Director of Game Design at Paizo. And today we're going to take a look at a little secret we've been keeping for the past three years. The new version of Pathfinder. So, uh, I, I honestly can't believe we kept it a secret. Like, it doesn't even make sense to me. We've been working on this for three years. I thought last year when I didn't give a speech, people were definitely going to know something was up. <laughs> but we managed to keep it, and uh, we announced it uh, uh, just here in March, and uh, it's going to come out in August. Uh, over the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to give you guys, hopefully not 30, maybe only 20, 10, come on, keep 5, it short. Five minutes. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a uh, look at the game. I'm going to show you a bunch of pages from the finished book. So read fast. <laughs> Before we get started, I do want to call out uh, some folks who have spent years working on this book. 
I, I really do want to call out the work of Logan, Mark, and Steven, uh, the members of the design team who have been uh, traveling uh, with me on this journey for the past three years. Those guys have done the lion's share of work on this book. They are amazing designers. They have delivered an amazing game that I am positive you are all going to love. In, but that's not all. There's so many people at the company who have touched this game. We have a team of developers. Amanda, Adam, Eric, Liz, and James all helped with this book. We have an amazing art team. Sarah, Sonia, uh, Sonia and Emily all helped. We had cover artist and all interior artist Wayne Reynolds. How did we pull that off? <laughs> Who did all of the art in the book? We had, we had uh, Taylor Fisher who did all of our interior uh, uh, border pieces, which you're going to get to see. Uh, we had an amazing editor team. There were so many editors working on this, it was, it was mind-boggling. Uh, I'm just going to list them real quick. Judy, Christopher, James, Simone, Cyrus, Leo, Avi, Liz, Avi, Avi, Liz, uh, Eric, uh, Adrian, Lacey, and Jason. And, and to be honest, those are just the people who worked on it like to get it to the printer. Almost everybody in the company touched this game. Through play tests, through stopping by to tell me what they, they thought, through reading rules, to sending emails, to pointing out pieces of the message board. Everybody at Paizo has helped make this game. And uh, I couldn't be uh, more proud of what we have created. So in lieu of an ordinary speech, I think uh, today what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read the entire core rulebook. <laughs> What is a role-playing game? <laughs> Pathfinder is a tabletop adventure role-playing game. RPG. An interactive story which one of the... <laughs> All right, plan B. Let's talk a bit about uh, what this uh, new version of Pathfinder is all about. This started with one goal. Create a new version of the game that was simple and easy for people to grasp and come to and learn, but still maintained all of the depth of complexity, the richness of world, and the same story that all of you have come to know and love over the past 10 years. That was our main goal. If you came to the new version of Pathfinder and you couldn't tell the types of stories that you're accustomed to telling, then we messed up. We didn't do our job right. So uh, to that end, uh, you know, we really wanted to make sure that, you know, I, I've said this a lot about, about making the game simpler but still deep, right? There's, there's a barrier to entry when you learn a game. There's, there's a lot of rules you need to learn before you can get to the fun. And we wanted to make sure you had to do as little of that as possible. But we also wanted to make sure that when you built a character, when you decided what brand of hero you wanted to make, you still had all of the choices in front of you that allowed you to make the character you wanted to make. And if you're a GM, we wanted to make sure that you had all the tools necessary to tell the types of stories that you want to tell. That's the goal. Beyond that, we just wanted to make sure that the math worked and high-level play wasn't broken. <laughs> that that was like six months of our design cycle, I'm serious. <laughs> so, uh, here you see uh, the cover to the Playtest Rulebook. This is going to release on August 2nd in both soft cover, hard cover, and special edition. I hope you pre-ordered it because the pre-order window is now closed. This book has gone to the printer. Woo! Woo! Woo to be honest, I don't know what to do with myself anymore. I just go in my office and take naps, it's fine. <laughs> I mean, I keep working really hard, boss. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, to walk you guys through this, uh, basically what I'm going to do for the rest of this speech is I'm going to walk you through the process of building a character, and as I do that, I'm going to walk through the book. Now, up to this point, we've revealed information about the fighter, the cleric, the rogue, the wizard, the paladin, and the alchemist. Good old Fumbus, our yes. goblin alchemist. Fumbus, he's my favorite. But today, I figured I'd give you guys uh, something new to look at. So today, we are going to go through the process of creating Linny. 
the iconic druid. So, um, I'm gonna make sure I'm at the right spot here. Oh, yeah, there we are. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna do here is the, the first thing you do when you make a character in the new version of the game is you uh, need to do what's called picking your ABCs, deciding your That was loud. Uh, so the first thing you need to do is pick your ABCs. This is deciding on your ancestry, your background, and your class. Ancestry is uh, what we call race now. It allows us to do a lot more of uh, diverse things within uh, a, a rule structure. And for uh, Linny, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to turn to the gnome section, because Linny's a gnome. So let's take a look at that. This is the uh, gnome spread from the book. And uh, once you decide to be a gnome, that, decides a, that sets a number of your uh, base kind of options, your speed, uh, some of your vision, uh, where some of your ability scores go right away. But then in addition to that, you get to pick a gnome uh, ancestry feat. Um, so for, for, for Liddy, she could pick up an uh, 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 animal accomplice, which lets her have a familiar. That's right, every gnome can have a familiar. I'm sure that's not going to get annoying real quick. <laughs> she could instead pick up a cantrip by selecting first world magic. Or she could get an extra lore skill that by deciding to become obsessive about one thing. So you'll notice one of the things that we did with a lot of these is that we, we use these as opportunities to build some of our Galarian world lore into the game. So if you're playing an elf and you want to be a forlorn elf, that's an ancestry feat you can select. Those sorts of things are now options that are presented right in the playtest rulebook. So once you've decided to be a gnome, you've decided how you were born, it's time to decide how you grew up. So next, we need to select Linny's background. So uh, background kind of talks about how you grew up and what you did in your early formative years. Linny could, uh, in Linny's case, we would probably pick Nomad, which gives her assurance and survival and the forest lore still. Here you'll see uh, a lot of our, uh, I think this might actually be all of the backgrounds that are in the playtest rulebook, but we think this is really fertile ground for expansion in the future. So uh, there's a lot of really exciting stuff on there that I'm sure will be decoded and put online in about four minutes. <laughs> so next up, we're still building our, our gnome. We've picked our ancestry and our background. It's time to look at our class. So let's go ahead and look at the layout for the druid. All of our classes open up with these gigantic uh, uh, illustrations from Wayne Reynolds that are some of the best art we have ever ordered. It is amazing stuff. Uh, Wayne did an amazing job putting these pieces together. Uh, for Linny, once you've uh, picked Druid as your class, you need to write down your proficiencies in a number of things. Like this will tell you your armor proficiencies and your saving throw proficiencies. It lets you pick some of your skill proficiencies. Uh, it just kind of walks you through all the basics of your character that are set by picking your class. But beyond that, there are a lot of choices to be made. Um, also, once you've made this decision, is about the point in time when you can finally solidify up all of your ability scores. One of the things that we did is, in the new version of the game, point by is now kind of the standard, but we do it in kind of a narrative fashion. So picking your ancestry gives you some... Uh, point by options for some of your ability scores. You still have plenty of flexibility to build the character how you want, but it does code some of them uh, down certain roads. Your background then does the same thing. Your class then does the same thing. And by the end, you have kind of this diverse breakout of ability scores that represents the choices you made to get where you are. All right. So it's time to make some choices uh, for Linny. One of the first choices that the druid is going to make is what order do they belong to? This is a new thing for druids. They get to pick their order. So she could decide to be a member of the leaf order, which makes her good at dealing with plants. Picking the storm order will give her elemental powers. Picking the wild order allows her to start changing shape at first level. But we all know that's not for Linny. She needs Dragami. So for her, She's going to go ahead and pick the animal order, which grants her an animal companion. Now, interestingly enough, uh, 
all of these order feats that you can get by picking which order, uh, they're available to other druids. So if you decide not to be in the animal order, but you still want an animal companion, you can pick one up. The game lets you do that, right? You can go back and grab it from the other things. But the order that you pick is the one that you're strongest in. Uh, so I also, uh, you know, that's, that's how some of the choices you're going to make as a first level druid. But I wanted to give you guys a sneak peek at some of the, the high level uh, druid feats that are up here. These are, these are the highest level ones. So, shh, don't tell anybody. Um, so you can see there's verdant metamorphosis up there that turns you into a plant person permanently. <laughs> One of my favorites is called Invoke Disaster. That lets you cast Earthquake a bunch every day. Because <laughs> I've never met a problem that isn't solved by casting Earthquake four times in a row. <laughs> And finally, there's Leyline Conduit. This is a 20th level ability that once you grab it, you can start casting once per minute a, I think it's fifth level spell or lower without expending the spell slot, so you can just keep casting those spells all day long. <laughs> it's good to be 20th level in the new version of the game, let me tell you. So once you've made all those decisions, you'll, you'll go and start uh, selecting some of your other choices. In her case, she needs to go and pick an animal companion and build that animal companion. This is one of the areas that I'm most excited about. Uh, in the druid is the rules for animal companion. So why don't I just show you those? Here they are. So uh, this is the start of the animal companion uh, section. There's a, a few more uh, pages of this, but uh, basically you pick your animal companion type. And one of the things that always I always wanted to see out of an animal companion was I wanted the animal companion to fight with you, like directly, not just I send it out and it does things. I want to fight with it. And if I do, maybe that gives me some special perks. Um, so Drogomi, for example, uh, gets her uh, an ability that she can take uh, her action to put the fall off balance for every attack that Linny makes against the person. So what it is is the, the animal companion kind of goes into this, this work with you mode and starts letting you get bonuses every time you hit it while it's doing that. It's really cool. And if you love it for, uh, for druids, rangers really like that ability. <laughs> But, that, but that's, for a, that's for a different banquet speech. All right. Am I doing another one? No? Nope. All right. Great. Okay. So uh, as you go up in power, your animal companion, it starts out young, then it becomes an adult, then it gains specialization, and you can kind of pick and navigate your animal companion. It's not just a static thing anymore. Two people with a cat animal companion will end up with different animal companions over time. So, there's a lot of other choices that go into making a druid, but let's be honest, you want to know about spells, right? Yeah. So, so clerics cast off the divine list, everybody knows that. Wizards cast off the arcane list. Druids cast off the primal list. It's one of the four spell lists of the game. There's still one more that we're keeping a secret. So, uh, I want to talk about a moment of, uh, from our playtesting. So uh, during our playtest, we, we were playtesting in the office, and uh, uh, we were running uh, through the playtest adventure that many of you are going to get a chance to play uh, uh, later this year. And we were doing a test, and I built a character, and then I ended up having to be in a meeting, and I couldn't join in in the playtest and play the character. So I handed it to Jeff Strand, who's one of our, uh, one of our folks in the warehouse. He's a super dedicated fan, loves playing the game. And he took this character who had access to this uh, particular primal spell and just wrecked the entire scenario. So let me show you, and James is going to love this. Dinosaur form. <laughs> So he didn't just cast this, though. He also cast Airwalk. <laughs> and he was a flying, charging Triceratops <laughs> that totally wrecked the entire encounter. He just owned it. <laughs> he's not here right now, is he? I don't think he is. But uh, he's going to get a hoot about this later in the office. So, um, so in addition to that, and you know, I mean, if you want to read other spells on that page, I mean, don't read Disintegrate, though. That spell's no good, so don't read that one. <laughs> no, seriously, that spell will destroy everything. Um, 
So, uh, you know, there's a lot of other choices that go into making characters. Uh, you'll need to pick your skills. You'll need to pick your, your, your uh, equipment and things like that. And uh, there's certainly some exciting stuff to show you there, but I kind of want to keep this short because Eric is staring at me. Yeah. Oh, I'm going. Um, so uh, what I do want to talk about, though, is magic items. You don't get to start with any, but forget that. Let's just skip to the good stuff. So, and some of these aren't even things that are good for Lenny. I just wanted to show off cool magic item art. I've got to be honest with you. When you have Wayne Reynolds draw a bunch of magic item art for you, you get amazing stuff. Like, I'm not joking. Some of that is ridiculously awesome. Uh, Lenny may not have much use of that for that Holy Avenger, but it is a ridiculously good sword. Um, you're also going to find that in this book um, are a bunch of brand new magic items that we invented just to play with some of the new rules uh, in the game. Uh, the, the, one of the big jokes is from the very early days, one of the first magic items I designed was called the Sky Hammer. This got mentioned like 50 times in our meeting before I finally wrote it. And I was just like, well, what if we had a, a hammer that every time you crit, it fireballs? <laughs> So we wrote that. <laughs> to be clear, it's ground zero. It's on you. <laughs> but you're immune. <laughs> No, the party isn't. No, it doesn't. It doesn't do anything for them. No. Who needs a party? You have a hammer that makes fireballs. I think that thing's plus five as well. So anyway, um, which by the way, if you guys haven't, if you haven't, if you haven't heard the way magic weapons work in the new version of the game, if it's a plus two weapon, let's just say it adds plus two on your attack roll. That's pretty cool. You want to be able to hit a little bit more. But instead of adding plus two to damage, it adds plus two damage dice. So just think about that a little bit, and when that orc comes at you with that plus five greatsword, understand he's going to be rolling 6d12. <laughs> Hope he doesn't crit. What happens when you kill him? Then it goes to me. I get to keep it. <laughs> uh, there's a bunch of really kind of cool new crazy magic items in this book, some of which uh, take the form of something called trinkets. Uh, trinkets are magic items that you can like affix to your weapon or armor that give you like a one-time bonus and then they, they fade away. They're kind of like scrolls, but for fighters. Um, so there's a lot of those that are in the book. There's also just some cool, crazy new items. Uh, some of them are on here. My, uh, some of my favorites on here. Um, the, the, you can open up your third eye to grant yourself a huge bonus on perception and be able to cast true seeing at will. Uh, you, you can use that mummified bat to uh, see unseen creatures. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so, I mean, there's just a bunch of amazing... I think that Mask of the First Lie, like, contains, like, bits of the, the very first lie ever told that makes you amazing at lying. There's just some great stuff uh, scattered throughout this book. Um, so, one of the things that I'm excited to announce here... Um, as we, as we kind of move on to some of the other parts, is that we have just learned that Hero Lab will be supporting the playtest. That slide was wicked cool. I wasn't expecting that. I, 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 Oh, all right, fair. All right, um, so uh, I'm going to let them speak more about that uh, through their through their own social media and stuff. But we just got that news. I don't want to say anything that isn't quite true. Uh, but we're really excited to have them on board, and uh, they are going to be able to offer you tools to help you make characters for the newest version of the game. So um, next up, I want to talk about the other things that come out at the same time as the uh, new core rulebook and uh, uh, the playtest rulebook, and that is. Doomsday Dawn, the playtest adventure. So this is an adventure that's divided up into seven parts. It'll be available in August uh, as a 96-page soft cover. You'll also be able to get it for free as a PDF at Paizo.com. Um, a lot of our playtesting effort will be focused on this adventure. Um, so 
I don't want to spoil too much, though, for a lot of reasons. One, the story is really cool and spans all the years that we have been making uh, Pathfinder. The first adventure actually starts like a month before the Swallowtail Festival <laughs> in 4707. Uh, and the adventure jumps around Galarian both in location and through time, uh, making its way to the modern day as this massive uh, mystery and riddle is uh, uncovered. So uh, this, is, this is a bit from the first adventure that, that I wrote, so I'm, I'm not going to leave it up for too long because I actually don't want you to read it. It's a secret. Um, <laughs> not sure why I showed it. Um, it's fine. I'll repeat the mistake by showing the first page of the second adventure. <laughs> I'm not good at this. Um, so every part is specifically designed to test various parts of the game. Once again, I don't want to talk about any of those because I actually want you guys to go into them as blind to that as possible. For us to get the best playtest feedback, we need you guys to just kind of make characters and play them as you would naturally. If you kind of get spoilers about it, you'll kind of corrupt your own playtest data because you will build your characters differently than if you didn't know anything at all. Um, you'll make new characters in many of the sections, but in some cases you'll advance some of your earlier characters. So there's a bit of an ongoing narrative for some characters and then you'll jump around uh, to other characters as you go. Um, I think one of these parts probably has Squealy Nord in it, but I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, um, yes, throughout this, you'll be traveling all around the world trying to uh, stop a plot that could spell the end of Galarian, and only your playtest can save it. <laughs> we weren't too on the nose on that, were we? We were a little on the nose on that. Yeah, right, fine. Okay, so uh, in addition, uh, there is a uh, pair of flip mats to go with it. The uh, Pathfinder Playtest flip mat is, is a uh, multi-pack with uh, two maps in it. So you get four sides each. They uh, Each of the sides four features... Sides four sides. What? Four Sorry, four sides total. <laughs> it depends how you fold them. <laughs> It'll work out. <laughs> it, it, we're playtesting four-dimensional maps. <laughs> so I, I don't want to give too many spoilers, but a whole lot of people are going to die on some of these maps. Moving on. Yes. A whole lot of people. A whole lot. Don't worry, James, we're going to bring that number up. <laughs> we got this. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, an overview of the playtest itself. Uh, to talk about how the process is going to work, I'll keep this brief. Um, so when, when, the, when the book drops, one of the other things that's going to be dropping is about a 125-page PDF of Monsters. We couldn't fit them in the core rulebook, there just wasn't space, so there's about 200 and I think our last count was 266 monster stat blocks in that thing. It's gigantic. And that covers all of the monsters that you will find in the Doomsday Daw Adventure, but it also covers a whole bunch of monsters we didn't use in there at all, so that if you want to start using these playtest rules to play other parts of the game, to play other adventure paths, to play other things, you have some tools to do that. So we're pretty excited about that. That PDF also includes hazards, traps, rules for building encounters and things like that. It's kind of your building encounter PDF. It's going to be really great and it's free and it drops the same day as everything else. Now once the playtest drops and the playtest adventure drops, uh, we're going to spend the first three weeks encouraging everybody to play part one. During that point in time, uh, we are going to release a bunch of surveys. Uh, some of those, uh, there's going to be a survey pointed at players, there's going to be a survey pointed at GMs. Uh, there's going to be more of a generic survey talking about various aspects of it. And we're going to do this for every single part of the adventure going forward so that we can get kind of targeted information. We're going to be asking some very specific questions during those things. And generally speaking, it's probably not a good idea to read those until after you've played. <laughs> However, the GM should have some notes uh, about what to keep track of while they're playing so that we can collect good data. Remember, we're trying to stress test various parts of the game. So some of these adventures really are designed to push you to your limits in various different ways. 
Uh, so that, after that, we're then going to switch to a two-week cycle, and every two weeks we're going to ask you guys to play the next part. So it, it moves kind of quick, because we've only got about five months between when this thing drops and when we really need to be getting it put together to go back to the printer. So, uh, but if your group plays a little slow, don't worry. You'll be able to submit your surveys later. We're just going to keep a cadenced focus going forward. And it's not just going to be surveys either. We are going to be doing a complete discussion on our message boards through Paiso.com. No worries there, everybody. We'll be there as well. We just need the surveys because there's so many of you now <laughs> that the only way we can get good data is through uh, massive surveys. Um, so after each part is done, we're also going to do uh, some Twitch streaming, talking about our experiences. We're going to let you guys know what we've learned. We're going to talk about what we've decided to change and what direction we're heading with some of the rules. We're going to take some questions that we get from our various surveys and through the message boards. We're going to answer them live through Twitch. We're also hoping to possibly even do some Twitch live plays of us playing the game. But we'll save those until after you guys have played them. That way, you know, we don't spoil the results. So, um... I want to leave you guys with uh, one more little thing. Because we, we haven't showed off really much of any monsters or anything. And if your players in the playtest are giving you too much gruff, and you're, you're just tired of them, <laughs> it's probably time to just throw the Grim Reaper at them. <laughs> so I... I'm, I'm going to tell you just a couple of these things, and then I'm gonna, and then I'm going to hand it back over to Eric because this thing has some abilities that are so ridiculously awesome. It's not even funny. Uh, aura of misfortune: all living creatures within 20 feet have to roll twice and take the lower result <laughs> on all D20 rolls. <laughs> yeah, super pug <laughs> Uh, a lot of our creatures, remember, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about how characters in the, in the new version of the game get reactions. You guys have heard us talk about this. Well, he has a reaction that says if anybody uses a concentration manipulate move action within 100 feet, he can teleport behind them for free and attack them. <laughs> if he critically hits you, you have to make a DC 44 fortitude save or die. <laughs> Brought back to life, right, Jason? Wrong! Oh. <laughs> yeah, he does only get one reaction. There is that. But, but if he does kill you, you can't come back. That's it. Roll a new character. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, just so you guys uh, have a sense, we may not be killing a lot of you in the delve, but this guy will get the job done. <laughs> so, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Eric to close out this banquet speech. We'll see. You guys having a good time so far? Yeah! All right, well, my console here says we're one hour and 17 minutes into this presentation, and I'm happy to say that with the assistance of all of our presenters other than Jason, we are now one-third of the way through today's presentation. No, I'm just kidding. We're done. Uh, so coming up here is the trivia contest. So thank you guys for your, your attention. I hope you enjoyed your meal. Before we get finished, I do want to recognize one other group of people, and that is Paizo's ops team. Without them, we would not have this thing set up at all. So I'd like Jeff and Sarah Marie and Will and other people who helped, and anyone who helped to set up PaizoCon, could you guys please stand up for a well-deserved round of applause? for the entire staff when I say PaizoCon is utterly exhausting to get uh, ready for, but once we're here, it's tremendously invigorating to get to play with you guys and throw dice, and, and uh, thank you all for coming as well. We really do appreciate it. Uh, if you consider yourself a giant Pathfinder nerd, I guarantee you, you are not as big of a nerd as John Compton and Mark Moreland. Uh, they have put together a trivia contest with the help of other people on the editorial staff, and it is fantastic. I know, like, 
six of the answers. Um, and so uh, that is an annual tradition here. If you're interested in participating in the trivia contest, there will be prizes. And uh, we would love to have you there. John will be our master of ceremonies. And that will start shortly after uh, we are done here. Uh, also this year, we've got a brand new thing uh, called Inspire Courage. It is an open bardic performance. Uh, so uh, make like uh, Lem here and throw the goat uh, as uh, we do in Cascade 13 at 10 p.m., which uh, is in uh, 55 minutes. So uh, how about that? We actually finished this thing in less than four hours. So uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you all for coming to PaizoCon, and thank you for continuing to support Paizo and Pathfinder. We couldn't do it without you. Thanks a lot, guys, and that's it.